Hi, everyone. I'm Dominic Machado. This is The Morley End. Today, I am joined by Estelle Vasudevan to take us through the week that was in Sri Lanka cricket. Um, but before we get started, just um, want to ask you all to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, to give us a follow and subscription if you are or following us on whatever pod platform you use. And also, we've got a newsletter. It's going to be great this week. There's a lot of interesting things coming out. Please subscribe. It's free. It comes straight to your inbox. Okay. Now that we've got it that out of the way, we've got a lot to talk about this week. Um, and I want to start with some brilliant work that Estelle has been doing. Uh, she just published an interview with Chamri Atapattu, uh, with Crick Buzz. Go read it if you haven't already. And um, it's a brilliantly insightful interview uh, as to who Chamri is, her experience with Sri Lanka cricket. And I just want to start today by asking a little bit about the interview. So Estelle, one thing that stood out to me is, you know, we have a great appreciation for Chamri the player. Um, I came away from that interview having a great appreciation for Chamri the person. Could you talk a little bit about what you learned um, about Chamri the person from conducting that interview? Yeah, absolutely, Dom. You're right. I think it it often gets overlooked, right? What type of person, what type of leader she is. And I think just talking to her, you get the sense that she's... One thing I really... What really struck me was that she genuinely loves the game and she loves playing cricket, right? And it's not necessarily about the, you know... I mean, obviously, she spoke a lot about, you know, being overlooked and stuff like that. But it's not necessarily about that. I, I remember watching her over the years when Sri Lanka wasn't doing well and how frustrated it would make her, mm -hmm. right? And it, that was, I think, purely out of her wanting to kind of drag her teammates along with her because she loved playing, right? And as a person, I think she's someone who's very keen on helping other players as well. It's very easy to be, you know a superstar and you know just take care of yourself but what I see is that she likes kind of being that mentor and role model to younger players uh, giving that kind of encouragement is important to her she spoke a lot about Heather Knight mm. at Sydney Thunder and you know what she kind of learned from them and I'm sure Chamari has been doing this for years as well since she's been captaining Sri Lanka for a while but that idea that, you know, giving confidence to a player is so important. She knows by experience. And that's what you can see her doing that with youngsters. Like you see her giving uh, players like Kavisha, Harshita opportunities in pressure situations. Sometimes she might come into some crit criticism because of that. But she's the type of person who wants to give them that exposure and help them kind of get to that level. Yeah. It's really clear, you know, um, that she's not about protecting her place, writing her records. It's about how do I make the team do well, right? And what role do I play in the team? Um, and I think one thing that's so fascinating is to see, um, you know, as you said, Estelle, wanting to learn. She she sounds like a sponge who was in these international environments. And, and you get the sense of, yes, she loves her cricket, but she also wants to be there so that she can learn and share that with her teammates. Um, and I wanted to, to kind of reflect on um, sort of the travails of being a, a female cricketer in Sri Lanka and kind of how Chamri talked about the difficulties that come with it. Um, and what sort of one of the takeaways I had is how difficult it is to be a female cricketer in Sri Lanka. So could you talk a little bit about um, the insight that you gained about how difficult that practice is? Because we're so used to covering the men's national team, which has all the resources, all the support. Um, what new insight did you gain from that part of the interview? Yeah, I mean, like she said, when she started, things were, you know, very much amateur, right? Um, just a few clubs played women's cricket and it wasn't. Now you have the uh, armed forces who play and then players who play for them get paid. So that's a significant step, right? But mm -hmm. when she started, it wasn't at that level. Um, and of course, players who came before her are the ones who, who really did the work to bring Sri Lanka cricket up to that standard. Um, one thing I felt was 
to be honest, Dom, like for my point of view, I I know it's hard, it's it's tough, you know, because there 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 aren't opportunities in Sri Lanka, right? I mean, I was talking to someone else last week about how things are so different in countries like Australia, where sport is so accessible, right? It's not the same for Sri Lanka, particularly if you are a woman. Like once you leave your school, um, play cricket, unless you get into a professional, like a club, there's no recreational side of it, right? So that access to sport is really limited. And even at school level, if you study in a school, like I didn't study in a school where we played cricket, right? And that's the truth for majority of schools in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. girls' schools. So it's not very accessible. So it's tough. But I also, but kind of, it kind of made me a bit sad uh, when she spoke about how it, all of this depends on the players' performances. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I understand from, you know, admi administrative point of view, because Obviously, you need to be able to financially sustain that kind of system as well. But it's like every time they go out there, they are playing for their survival almost, right? And even whether that's, you know, getting the support from Sri Lanka cricket and developing as a national team, and also like in terms of franchises, like I'm, if now the WPL is about to start, right? If she doesn't do well at the WPL, that might be the only chance she ever gets, right? In that tournament. Because that's just the reality for players who come from teams like Sri Lanka. Mm. So it's it was kind of sad to hear her say that, you know, all of this depends on how we perform. Mm. And, you know, when we do well, everyone looks at us and says, oh, no, we should support them. Mm. But it's 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 a cycle isn't it like if you get support you probably do well yep. and you do well you get more support so if you don't get that initial kind of backing and support then you kind of struggle and mm -hmm. you can see that for me a clear reason why sri lanka has done well in the last couple of years is because we've play, been playing more regularly right we had that nearly two year gap of not playing cricket after covid and then to come back from that now that they're playing regularly, I mean, this year alone, uh, the the WPL is on now. After that, Sri Lanka touring South Africa, and then they have West Indies coming over to Sri Lanka. They have the Asia Cup. They have the World Cup qualifiers. They have the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Like five years ago, mm -hmm. that's not how things yeah. worked, right? So that's a clear reason why they're doing this. So I hope that, you know, that, that uh, backing and that... Um, support comes even when they're not performing so that they can turn those things around. Yeah. Yeah. Still, I think you're right to say that it's kind of backward, right? You mm -hmm. put in resources so that they can perform, not they perform so you can put in resources. Um, and, and I think that's a backward model that's not going to lead the team forward. Um, but I am very glad that they'll be playing all that cricket. I think that's, that's very exciting. And I think the team is, is very exciting at the moment. Um, one thing that kind of um, made me a little sad was reading that Chamri kind of had a two-year cap um, on, on her playing days. Uh, what was your reaction to that? You know, you're seeing a batter at the top of their power saying, okay, only two more years. Um, do you think she's flexible on that? Or do you think, and, and what do you kind of think is going to happen um, after Chamri leaves in two years? I think, you know, I know she mentioned it one time in that interview, but there have been a couple of occasions when she's wanted to actually walk away, right? Mm. And that's been, you have to, from her perspective, to have that amount of pressure on you. And, yeah. you know, she, she's not going to come, come up to an interview and say, look, the pressure is too much for me, right? But she's human at the end of the day. She's going to feel that. Um, and... I think she gave a deadline of two years because she really does not want to stick around until someone says, look, she's old. She's not mm. as good as she was. We need to play young players, right? And and we've seen that happen plenty of times, even in the men's game, yeah. where you have players who you think are past their date, right? And she doesn't want that to happen. Mm. I do think, though, that if she's still playing the way she's playing right now, that 
they would probably be able to convince her to stay on. Um, but I suppose at the moment, her target is 2024 T20 World Cup and 2025 yeah. 50-over World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, it'll depend on, I think, how she's playing. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's an admirable selflessness to say, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to step away and let some of the younger players come in because they need their space to shine. And speaking of this, I think this is a good transition to our next topic. Uh, last week, the women's first ever NSL concluded. Um, Chamri was not taking part in that and was kind of observing what was going on, which makes me think she probably has a future uh, coaching in Sri Lanka, which would which would be fantastic. Um, but I wanted to know what your takeaways were from uh, from the recently concluded women's NSL series. Who were the players who stood out to you? And um, yeah, and we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was an important tournament, I think, or two tournaments that they conducted, because like you said, it's the first time they're having an NSL for the for the women. Um and I think it was quite important that they also didn't they didn't want Chamari to take part because she needed that rest. And also that gives other players kind of the opportunity to shine. Um, in terms of players to watch, I think the usual suspects were good. Mm -hmm. You had the, you know, Harshita Samaravikrama made runs. Um, and you had, you know, uh, Sachini Nisansala was another one who did well. She, she was... Um, I think she made her debut in 2021 and was pretty good in the Asia Cup, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. but had a couple of injuries and had to miss out. So she was one. Then um, you had uh, Marsha Shehani, I think is a, is a player to have an eye out on because she's one of those rare players who can actually hit the ball, mm. right? Lower, in the lower order, but ball some off spin as well. So, um, Kavisha Dilhari was player of the tournament in both competitions. So obviously everyone's got their eye on her already. She, she is someone who's been consistently good. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say what was disappointing for me is that in the T20 competition, the scores weren't great. Like you had a lot of, you know, 90, 80, yeah. 100, that type of score. So that's not ideal for Sri Lanka and what they're looking for they should be looking to do in the future. But also at the same time, right, the, the, the World Cup is in Bangladesh. Mm. <clears throat> so that, I mean, that kind of throws things off a bit because you don't know what type of surfaces you're going to get yeah. um, in Bangladesh. It could very well be slow, low turners where totals of 120 are winning totals. Yeah, right. Uh, maybe maybe a decade after the 2014 triumph in in Bangladesh, well, we might get a repeat. Um, yeah, I thought, um, you know, the thing I had not realized was how good Kavisha uh, Dilhari was as an all rounder. Uh, I knew about her bowling, but seeing her, you know, actually bat a bit and get that time in the middle was really good to also see her capabilities. Um, and I think one thing that was interesting for me to see is sort of the the amount of groundswell of support around this when this was kind mm -hmm. of announced almost ad hoc. It was just, you know, it was like, OK, in a week we're going to be holding this. What do you think the chances are that this is going to become something that's done annually, um, something that will, again, as as you said, pour resources into making the team better and then have positive results when they go and play internationally? I think it's going to be something that Sri Lanka cricket stick with because it, at, over the years, there's always been this push, particularly in the men's game, to have a provincial competition mm. because the club competition was seen as too watered down, right? And Sri Lanka cricket, I think, have done a good job in that this year, sorry, last year, we we did see uh, them tr kind of trialing, having a lot of new clubs in the women's game as well. They had SSC, NCC, mm. uh, Coles Cricket Club, all fielding teams. And, you know, uh, having that competition as an invitational tournament. Mm. Um, and then... Then they introduced the NSL where you had, you know, the, the best of those players yeah. coming together into four teams. Um, so I do think that's kind of the plan of action that 
the current administration want to go with that's how they want to proceed and i think that's that's a really good idea the only thing is probably they need to be looking at longer tournaments like if you look at the women's two tournaments they they didn't last a month yeah. it was all uh, you know one fixture in each round so um that's something they look to change but i think it's a good start uh because one big problem that Sri Lanka has is they're not get in the women's side. Mm -hmm. They don't have the feeder system to give you a huge number of players, right? But I think one of the reasons for that is because there is no kind of... At the end of the day, the finances matter, right? So if you can't kind of at least sustain or break even mm -hmm. by playing cricket, then it's going to be a struggle for a lot of these girls particularly who are coming from outside Colombo, right? Mm. So now they've contracted 60 girls. So at least that 60 have a mode of income. It's also encouragement and kind of a incentive for the others who are outside that 60 yeah. to perform well and kind of put their all into uh, the game if they want to go to higher level. So it's moving, the, it's moving slowly, but it's moving in the right direction, I think. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. And the idea of consolidating a pool of players who can build off of one another's knowledge and uh, older players can be with younger players, you can build some type of team identity. I think that's all really, really excellent. And uh, we'll be looking forward to that South Africa uh, series coming up. Uh, as you all will remember, er, Sri Lanka has sprung a big surprise on South Africa in the first game of the T20 World Cup that South Africa was hosting last year. So let's hope for some repeat of that action. Okay, and speaking of T20 series, we are recording just hours after the conclusion of the T20 series between Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. Um, it's been an exciting series. Sri Lanka takes it 2-1. Uh, we should say that Afghanistan was without Rashid Khan and without Mujib as well. Um, but I think overall, we'll, we would say that um, this was a very good performance from the Sri Lankan side and um, that hopefully things are trending in the right direction for the World Cup. So Estelle, um, I'm curious, what are your takeaways from this highly competitive series that's just been concluded with Afghanistan? Yeah, see, it it's kind of a funny one because I know a lot of people are going to talk about the fact that Rashid Khan and Mujib were not playing, right? But I think what we need to look at is just the manner in which Sri Lanka played. It's They seemed like they had kind of switched strategies a bit. The intent was very, very different from what we've seen over the last 12 months, right? I mean, you've occasionally seen, like, for example, Kusal Mendes in, in the first couple of games of the World Cup, the ODI World Cup, we saw him go absolutely crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a anomaly. Yeah. But in this series, both the ODI and the T20 series, a lot of the batters have started to play with a lot more intent. Patum Nisak has obviously been kind of the the standout in that sense. Um, he seems to have developed a new gear in his game, right? Uh, but otherwise, even like players like Mendes, who are who have always been capable of it, but haven't really stepped it up to that level, are looking to score faster, which is which is a really good sign. Mm -hmm. I think in today's game as well, I, I unfortunately couldn't watch the entire game, but just looking at the scorecards and the way guys like mm -hmm. Sadira uh, Kamino Mendes have battered, it's encouraging to see where this team will go, particularly with the World Cup, you know, a few months away. And I, I believe we have only three more T20s to go before yeah. that World Cup. So, I mean, it, it's encouraging Yes, we have to remember that they didn't have two of their best bowlers, but just the the, the strategy wise, it was good, I think. Yeah, and um, I 100% agree with you, Estelle. The intent was different. Um, I've been counting dot balls this series, and uh, in the first T20, I think it was 39 total, but they only had uh, 10 in the power play and 20 in the first 13 overs, sorry, 26 in the first 13 overs. 
And in the second match, they had only 20 in the first 13 overs. So there's a real shift in intent, right? There was a lot of dot ball playing before. Even someone like Mendes, who could kind of catch up, has been playing fewer and fewer dot balls. They've been aggressive from ball one. They're taking advantage of the field restrictions. And I think that's great to see. It's it's an uh, admission on the side that playing the way they played in 2014 is not going to work. They need to up the game. They need to up the momentum. They need to um, always be attacking. And I think one thing they've realized is there's no point in leaving wickets in the shed, right? Um, having Dawson Shanika not bat, for example, should not happen, right? You have to push on and push on as much as you can. The, the 120 ball limit, you shouldn't be worried about getting bowled out you should be going aggressively and um i think a lot of credit has to be given to hasaranga as a captain i think one thing that's been interesting is he's brought himself in at three different times in the inning so uh he came in at six i think in the first innings he came in at five in the second and today he came in at four depending on what the run rate requirement was and it seems like he views himself as sort of like a fuel injector. So he comes in and he boosts the rate of scoring. He plays hell for leather. And I think using him in that way really unlocks the potential he has and also adds a dynamism to what we're doing, right? So um, chasing 210, he says, okay, I need to be in early and try to play a blinder so that we can, you know, we can get across the line. Uh, it's also been, as as you said, a sell encouraging to see uh, Sidira play with aggression, right? We saw kind of a very slow knock that was a bit confusing the other day, but today we saw him try to hit out from ball one and seeing that ability and seeing him able to turn that switch on. Um, and even Matthews, right? Even over the the progression of the, of um, the innings we've seen, right? He's getting the message. And he said in the interview a couple of days ago, he wants to turn those first couple of balls into ones and twos rather than dots. And so that intent, that belief, that kind of thinking about the T20 game, I think is really, really good. So I, I, I'm I'm happy to see that. And uh, yeah, you're right. It's the only three games left. And those three games are in about a week in Bangladesh. So we want to see them really tighten that up and, and perform well and continue with this aggressive methodology. Um Given the batting aggression, I wanted to ask a little bit about side balance. What did you make about the way that the 11s were balanced in these matches? Um, what did you think about the selection of personnel? Um, was there anything you would have changed? Yeah, to be honest, like you spoke about Vanindu, right? And how he's been kind of using himself as a floater. I think he's he's that's dead set how how he should be used in, in T20 cricket. But I do think that gives you then an option to play the extra bowler. Mm. Because I'm not sure you want Dasun Shanaka coming in at number eight, right? It feels like a wasted resource. Um, I mean, in today's game, I think it helped that they were chasing and guys like Sadira, Kamindu Mendis, who are generally not, you wouldn't say a typical like a elite mm -hmm. T20 player range, right? They knew what they needed to get. So they were able to kind of adjust, right? But when set, setting a total, that might be different. And you don't want someone like, for example, I think Sadira made 25 of 24 or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. in one of the previous games. You don't want that type of innings and then have Shanaka facing five deliveries, yeah. right? Yeah. You'd rather have Sadira nine of three and then yeah. be dismissed. Yeah. So I think in that sense, Sri Lanka have the opportunity maybe to try playing the extra bowler. I mean, mm. given that you've got guys, you've got a good fast bowling you know, battery yeah. in the squad. Um, I don't think that would be a bad idea because, yeah, you're going to have days where like that previous game, you get all out before the 20 overs are done. But I don't think that matters that much if you're getting the runs, right? Yeah. Um, and then when you have that extra bowling option, you're essentially, Hasarang is essentially like two players in one yeah. then, yeah. right? So you've got six proper bowlers in your side and also, in a sense, six proper batters in your side. So, mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I don't think Sri Lanka will go in that route. I think it's going to be 
seven four. Mm. Uh, but that would be a good. That would definitely be something I would at least try, particularly mm. with how well Hasaranga has batted. Because if you look, if you look at his career. Although we call him an all-rounder, he hasn't had consistent success with the bat. And most of that is because he's been stuck at number seven or eight, mostly eight, um, where he's he's also coming in with a lot of pressure, right? Yeah. But when he's got, he's kind of almost given himself that license that mm. he can come in whenever he wants and go after the bowling. Yeah. Um, and hopefully that aggression and that, that kind of, Leadership also leads him to kind of take a chance. Mm. Maybe we get that extra bowler in and put some pressure because our bowling is already really good, right? Yeah. And uh, if we can just put that extra pressure on and have that extra option, then you're not depending on Matthews to bowl power play overs um, yeah. or someone like Shanaka to bowl in the middle, right? They've, they've not done badly. But if you have that insurance of, of having a genuine bowler, I think, yeah. that would really strengthen the team. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think um, Dawson was left in the hut last time. They scored 187 in the, in the second T20, but he didn't face a ball, right? That That's that's crazy to me that uh, you want him to be one of the people who is facing balls in T20 cricket. And even today, you know, when he came in, he missed a couple of early deliveries because he does take a few balls to kind of get mm. warm. Yes, he's a brilliant pace hitter once he gets in, but he needs to see a few balls. And and, and it's really hard to say, okay, 10 balls left in the innings, do as much as you can. Um, and I think you would just use that resource slightly better, right? We're currently using him more as a bowler than we are as a batter. Mm. And that I think is a mistake. Um, and I think, as you said, Hasaranga provides a lot of flexibility to that lineup. He can, Shaunaka can still come in at seven. Angelo can come mm. in at six. I think what it'll require is dropping one of the top order batters who maybe is more play, prone to playing in anchor type innings, right? If you really want to uh, invest in the strategy of being aggra ultra aggressive throughout the innings, you probably need to let go of someone like DDS who just doesn't seem a good fit um, for, uh, for, the so for, for this particular way of batting. Um, and, and so, and, and the other part of it is, yes, Angelo Matthews has had some success in the power play and he, he takes wickets in the power play, but how much better is it if he's a backup bowling option and you have say Patirana, who has been brilliant. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, you've got Dilshan Madushanka or Benura Fernando, and then you have Dishmanta Tamira. You have a lot of pace on the ball. Um, you've got two brilliant spinners, right? Having 20 good overs of bowling is really key. And then having, you know, someone has a bad day, you can bring in yeah. Shanika or Matthews to cover for them. And I think that's plenty of coverage there. So I would I would agree with you that 6-5 looks a bit better than 7-4. I think we can squeeze a little bit more. I think there's a little innate conservatism here. Um, mm. So speaking of which, do you think, right, if say we're we're going to continue playing 7-4, do you think Matisha gets into the into the playing 11 as one of the two bowlers if Sri Lanka has their full gamut of choices? It's going to be a really tricky one. No, I think he'll depend a lot on fitness uh, with Chamira in particular. Um if he's fit, it's hard to see him missing out. And obviously, Madhushanka is a, a guy who they will definitely play as well. Yeah. So then you've got him and Chamira, and then you've got Mahish Dikshana also. So I think that's where you kind of have to be a bit flexible because at the death, I know they both Tushara and Patirana went for runs today, but they are incredibly accurate, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they they bring something else to that bowling lineup, which you can't find. I mean, the way he performed in that first game and the speeds with which he was bowling, it, it it's incredible to me that he he had only played like that was his second game, yeah. right? Um, just the the way he's come, he's he's really grown in the last year or so. It's been incredible. So, I think he'd be unlucky to miss out. 
Um, but I guess it will also have to be kind of playing the situation and kind of looking at managing workloads and yeah. all of that uh, come to work up because even though Sri Lanka have only three more games, he's got a full IPL mm -hmm. season to come. I'm sure he'll play at least 75 to 80 percent mm -hmm. of the games if he's fit. So you also need to keep his kind of fitness mm. in in check as well. Yeah, I, and I think um, one the speeds with which he is bowling in excess of one fifty k, and he's twenty one years old is is just astonishing. And and one thing that struck me is that if you're a tail ender batting at the death, you stand no chance mm. against him. You can't put bat on ball, um, and he's so accurate with that Yorker. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's incredible. And, you know, we saw that he has a little ways to go as a 50 over bowler, but as a 20 over bowler, particularly bow bowling within a framework of, OK, one of the middle over a cu couple middle overs and then the two back end. Right. And you might even say three back end overs if you really want to bank. Um, he's so good at it. He is there. There aren't very many bowlers in the world who are better at performing at the death. And that I think in in T twenty cricket is so crucial because those over are the overs that can go for big runs. Those are the overs that are liable to go for thirty, that are liable to go for twenty five. But if you have someone who can take wickets, um, who you can mm -hmm. set, who who has a game plan for that and is so accurate at it, I think it's very hard to leave him out of the squad. Um, and I think again, this this to my mind speaks to why you need to play five. Uh, bowlers, because if you can get, if you can bank on those death overs, um, that's an incredible advantage to your side. Um, and to be able to get through the tail quickly is another big, big advantage. Hasaranga obviously has that skill as well. No one can read as googly if you're, if you're below seven. Um, but I think that's really, really important. And it'll be interesting to see um, what Sri Lanka does. So last question um, about the series. What do you think they should, so the next series that's coming up is Sri Lanka is touring Bangladesh and next week they're going to be playing the T20s. What changes, if any, do you want to see from this side? What approaches do you want to see them take? What do you want to see them try out in these final three games before, um, before the World Cup? I think they've essentially got kind of the core of the team that they're going to go with, right? Um, it's just that like you said, I think that decision of who's going to be three and four, mm. are we going to play both DDS and Samaravikrama or Kusal Janit and Samaravikrama or do we leave one of them out and mm. get the extra bowler in? Those will be questions that we will learn the answers to, I think, yeah. during the Bangladesh series. Um, I also think in terms of bowling, I know I saw a lot of criticism about, you know, Dilshan. Well, Dushanka didn't play, this guy didn't play, that guy didn't play. But I think it's a lot about rotating and managing mm. players as yeah. well. Like, I mean, Matisha, the, there's really no point in him playing ODI cricket at the moment. Yeah. Because, you know, we're not playing, we don't have a major tournament for four years, right? So, with the T20 World Cup coming up, you don't really need to be pushing guys like that in the team. Mm. Um, similarly, the senior players who who uh, the selectors wanted to bring in to the side, right? The, the likes of Akila Dananja, mm -hmm. Angelo Matthews, DDS, they're all here for this World Cup. Yeah. So they need to get as much game time, I think, as possible mm -hmm. so that some of them, like Dananja and Matthews, haven't played T20 mm -hmm. cricket for Sri Lanka in a long time. Yeah. So they need to kind of get back into it. So those are the only things. I don't think there should be too many changes in the squad. I just think that they need to kind of fine-tune things. Look, mm. it's no matter what we do in these last three games, the World Cup is going to be a different beast altogether. We know that, right? We know that in terms of quality, we are not among the top, I would say, top five teams, right? It's, it's on a special day, we might be able to cause mm. some real damage. But other than that, if you look at how Sri Lanka has performed, we are kind of in the middle of the table. We're we're not bottom, but we're definitely not in that you know title contention yeah. type of team, right? Yeah. So 
they need to keep that in mind when they're fine tuning things to mm -hmm. get what works for us best yeah what 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 helps us make use of the players that we have mm -hmm. to the best in the best way right and i think you're right that it is um expectations we'll talk about that you know in, in the time to come but i think one thing that the side will be looking at is not only 2024 but 2026 when the world cup comes to sri lanka um and and i think that's also got to be in people's head right now is how are we preparing for that and i think you know rotation is really important dilshan madashanka is going to go and train with the mumbai indians for two and a half months. I don't think it's a big deal that he's not playing these three matches. And I think, um, in fact, he's been struggling a little bit and, and having some time off and not having the pressure um, is really good for him. So I think with the bowling side, they will all get plenty of experience over the next few months. Uh, to mention, Dushmanta Chamira just got signed by KKR. Uh, we'll see if he, how much he plays, but I take that as a pretty good sign concerning his fitness because I'm sure... They they check that before uh, before signing him up. So our bowlers will have plenty of time on the big stage in the next couple months, and it'll kind of be up to the batters to to keep themselves sharp um, for this for this World Cup. Uh, last thing that I wanted to mention um, or bring up. So I mentioned Dushmantha Chamira being signed by KKR, but. Um, Oh, yes, it was the LPL. The LPL schedule has been announced, right? So July 1 is when the LPL starts. As Mark pointed out to us uh, off air, the World Cup final is June 29th. So is SL uh, Stel, do you think SLC is sending us a message to not expect Sri Lanka to be <laughs> in the final this year? Oh, can I do a mark and say... Maybe it'll be like the perfect homecoming after a World Cup win, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> win the trophy on the 29th, get on a play in the same night, come back on July 1st. Yeah. It's what, Candy versus Jeff now. <laughs> yeah, have um, a big party. No, <laughs> no I mean, yeah. I, I think it's scheduling is definitely an issue, right? With the LPL, yeah. I mean, we are in our, what, fourth season Fifth, fifth, now, uh, fifth, fifth yeah. season, and we still yeah. don't have a proper window for it, yeah. which is, I think, really, it's a significant concern, right? Yeah. Because you need to have that kind of set period of time so that not only are your players available to you, but you also have access to mm -hmm. a lot more overseas signings. Yeah. Um, but I mean, look, like I said, it's tough at this very moment. It's very tough to say that Sri Lanka will make the final. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it was intentional to have just a couple of yeah. days between the <laughs> World Cup final and the yeah. LPL. And and it, it is a good thing because it doesn't conflict with the 100. I don't think it com, uh, mm -hmm. conflicts with the CPL either. So that is sort of two streams of players that hopefully they will have access to um, for making this a strong tournament. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of this discussion coming up in the next few months. But I think, you know, I agree with you, Estelle, you you put them in the sort of five to eight category at the moment. But I think on their day, um, and if they if they use strategy properly, right, I think that's one of the one of the hallmarks of when Sri Lanka have overachieved. That's what they've done. They've been strategic and smart about mm -hmm. it. I think they had there's not a small chance that they could make a, a semifinal. Um, be anything beyond that, anything could happen, but I think perhaps a, a young side that hasn't been seen a lot by the likes of um, some of the teams that they'll be playing, right? And maybe bowling friendly conditions um, in the West Indies, particularly. Uh, we don't know what the USA will hold by any shot. Could mean, could mean that we could see Sri Lanka in the in, in the semifinals. Uh, I'm still holding out hope. I'm, I'm putting I'm putting on my Mark hat here. Um, but see, the, the, that the thing is, right, like over the last two T20 World Cups, we've like been impressed and, you know, yeah. the team's done really well, right? If you, general feeling has been that the team's done really well, but they haven't managed to beat any. Mm. Or, I mean, Australia, obviously, you know, world champions, but 
those type of teams we haven't been able to beat we run them close yeah. but we haven't been able to beat any of those teams so that yeah. is a concern i think in like that's a reason to temper your expectations <laughs> a bit yeah. because generally in in the past two editions we've had that you know that first round where you play the associate countries mm. and kind of have to qualify to the main draw right and in in 2021 sri lanka smashed that like absolutely yeah. smashed it and everyone was so happy about it but end of the day we didn't really beat any big teams mm. the next world cup australia we lost to namibia right yeah um still did all right but again kind of just a little less than expected expected mm. so i mean i i just hope like i said before I hope they go in with, you know, a plan to play things mm. to our strengths. Yeah. It might not 100% bring success, but there's always that opportunity to learn from. Obviously, they've learned from the World Cup in India, right? With yeah. the pictures yeah. and the intent and all of that. Yeah. They've finally seen, maybe a decade too late, that yeah. <laughs> you can't, yeah. you're not consolidating and winning limited overs cricket anymore, right? So that's been a learning experience. And like you said, 2026, maybe they'll use this. If they play things right, mm. that could be the tournament where Sri Lanka... I mean, I say this before every World Cup, but like <laughs> you can always hope, right? Right. I, I think, yeah, that's, that's always the tricky part. How do you... Um, yes, you're beating the teams who should, but how do you win those key moments against good teams? And I think that's one thing uh, I took away from this white ball series against Afghanistan is they won some key moments where, uh, you know, that first ODI, uh, there's that big partnership. They're able to take a wicket and slow down the rate of scoring. Uh, the second ODI, the opening partnership is going hell for leather. And they're, I think, 153 for one. And they're able to bowl out Afghanistan for 158 or something like that. But those match turning moments, they mm -hmm. seem to have put their their finger on the pulse. And I, and, and I guess my my contention here is that there's a little bit of an attitude difference now after some of these experiences realizing we can't just give it away we have to fight for fight and scrap for every single point of the game it's not just good enough to play a good 10 overs a good 15 overs but we have to win the moment and i think hopefully maybe this is something that we'll see more consistently we'll be able to tell after the bangladesh series cuz um, you know, a month ago, we were singing a very different tune after Zimbabwe, right? That this team wasn't prepared, didn't look good. Um, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens when they play their arch rival. Uh, I'm sure Mark will be back uh, by then to tell us some things about Bangladesh and, and, and how we are never going to lose to them ever again. Okay. Well, if you made it this far into the, this episode, give us a follow, a like, a subscribe, um, sign up for the newsletter. But otherwise, we will be back next week. Thank you. Bye.